Okay, hi everyone. Um, let's get started. Uh, my name is Will Hansen. I'm Director of Reader Services and Curator of Americana at the Newberry Library. Welcome to the discussion of the film, The Booksellers. Um, so quickly, the agenda, um, we're gonna do introductions of each of our panelists. Um, then we'll have some, a few clips, four clips from the film to show and a discussion point around each of those clips um, among the panelists. Uh, and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, as Gina just mentioned, we'll, we'll have um, uh, the chat available for that and I'll be, I'll be monitoring that and can, can feed questions to the panelists. Um, so uh, before we start with that, uh, thank yous. Uh, thanks to Johnson Rare Books and Archives for sponsoring this program. As some of you might know, this was originally going to be an in-person viewing of the film and discussion at the RBMS conference in Bloomington, Indiana. Uh, when that was canceled, we decided to move this online. And big thank yous to Johnson Rare Books and Archives for the sponsorship and also to the folks at ACRL for, for um, facilitating this move online. Tori Anderla, the indispensable Tori Anderla, uh, Gina Parsons Diamond, who is moderated, who is uh, sort of running this program today, uh, Eloise Sharp, who also helped with the logistics for it. So thanks to, to all those folks as well. Um, and additionally, uh, thank you all uh, who watched the film with the link that was sent out at the RBMS listserv and a couple of other places, um, which uh, helps support RBMS's scholarship fund. Uh, so thank you to everybody who watched the film with that link. Um, and uh, helps with that effort. Um, so this is me. Uh, I'm not the important part of this slide. The important part of this slide is the reminder about the recording. Um, and uh, thanks in advance for providing feedback. You'll get a, a message about providing feedback after the session today. So please do provide feedback um, uh, as you can. Uh, you already heard about using the chat to ask questions and make comments. I'll also note that the chat is recorded. Um, and that includes even messages that aren't sent to everybody. So uh, if you do want to have a back channel conversation or make snarky comments about my quarantine hair or whatever, um, you'll probably want to do that in a forum other than the chat. Okay, um, here are our panelists. So I'll ask each of you to introduce yourselves. Um, maybe we can start with uh, Dan. Dan, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure, uh, I'm Dan Wexler. I'm owner of Sanctuary Books and I'm one of the producers on the booksellers. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Athena? Sure, my name is Athena Jackson. I'm the director of the Library Special Collections at UCLA Library and a proud member of the RBMS community. Thanks, Athena. Uh, Brad? Hi, I'm Brad Johnson. I'm the president of the Antiquarian Booksellers Association of America and uh, the junior partner here at uh, Johnson Rare Books. Thanks, Brad. And Heather, last but not least. Uh, hi, I'm Heather O'Donnell. I run Honey and Wax Booksellers here in Brooklyn, uh, and I'm one of the booksellers. Okay, so that's all of us. So, um, I'm going to end the slideshow here and we'll move on to uh, questions. First question will be without a clip and the question is for Dan. It probably makes sense to start with a little bit of discussion about how this film came to be. So Dan, do you mind telling us a little bit about the, the backstory behind the film and how and why it got made? Sure. Uh, I did a little math the other day. This is my 30th year uh, being connected in some way to the, to the book world. And not long after graduating from college, I got a job in a, in a used bookshop, Second Story Books. And as time went on and I, be, I became an independent bookseller myself, I, I really began to wonder as someone who was always fascinated with film, why the book world hadn't received treatment in a documentary as, as practically everything else I could think of had. Um, but it's one thing to have an idea, another to, to see it through. And uh, as time went on, I began to, to dabble in film a little bit and I met D.W. Young and Judith Mizraki, who are husband and wife, and uh, both very involved in, in film. They're full-time film people. Mm -hmm. And when I shared with them this idea, um, they were really excited about it, and we started to develop it. And, it, and over time, uh, in thinking about how to do it, we, we wanted it in some sense to be a meditation on the book. Um, but of course, it was also going to, to be told through the eyes primarily of rare booksellers, but also uh, collectors, librarians, uh, 
and uh, somehow to, to give it shape both historically, but also with a look to the future. So um, the big break for us came when we submitted the film to the New York Film Festival and were accepted. Um, that's a great launching pad for any film. And since then, uh, it's been a, a great road, unfortunately, and interrupted by what we're all experiencing right now. But at least um, we got a good start. And, and now thanks to um, many people, including uh, what we're, we're writing around right now with Johnson, our rare book sponsoring this, um, it gives an opportunity to discuss the film and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, discuss uh, this whole world of books that we love. Thanks, Dan. Um, so I'm going to show the first clip now, hoping I can get the screen sharing to work. Uh, just a note from my fellow panelists, if you didn't see it in the chat, if you can mute yourself when you're not talking, that will help with some of the ambient sound that I think some folks are having. Um, so just mute yourself if you're, when, you're, when you're not talking. Um, let me get the first clip queued up here. So the first clip will be focused on sort of the theme of change in book selling and in the book trade in general. Um, and it'll be about 35 seconds. So let's go ahead and play it. Uh, right now, once I get the screen expanded. Keep having to move this window around, apologies. Okay, here we go. Okay, so there's our first clip, and uh, oh, it sounds like maybe people couldn't hear. Is that is that the case? <laughs> it's always something, you know. It's always something. Um, so let me. Will Tori suggesting to share audio from your screen? Share audio from my screen. You know, we ran through this and it worked fine. And now, of course, it's not working. Um, ah, there we go. OK. Believe I've figured out the problem now. Well, let's, uh, I'll, I'll work on this, but basically the clip is about the changes in the internet uh, that the internet made to the book selling profession um, and how damaging it was to cer a certain kind of bookseller who didn't deal in the absolute rarest material. Um, uh, and um, how for others it was fine because they were dealing with some of the rarest material. So, um, I don't know if uh, um, the panelists want to just uh, speak to that um, while I'm working on the the clips, um, and I'll keep working on it while you're while you're doing that. Sound okay? So um, maybe maybe if Heather wants to start that, since she was one of the people speaking in the clips, that might be good. Sure. Well, uh, as I recall, that that part of the film is just talking about the impact on the trade as a whole of the internet and the fact that the uh, rush of new material online made it clear in a way that hadn't necessarily been the case that a lot of books that were commonly considered to be rare were in fact not really scarce at all, that there were hundreds or even thousands of copies out there. Um, and 
the result of that was that a lot of dealers who had sort of banked on being able to price that kind of medium rare material at a particular price point and make money that way found that market just drop out as people realized they could get the same book for like 99 cents plus shipping from some mega seller online. Um, and so it forced for a large part of the rare book trade and also just like the secondhand bookstore trade, um, a real reevaluation of the business model. Anybody else want to chime in on that? Let's pivot maybe to thinking about our current moment um, and uh, this as another moment of, of really drastic change um, uh, and uh, thinking about how uh, our current moment of this pandemic um, uh, might be another moment of, of really drastic change in the bookselling profession. Um, and how uh, booksellers and uh, uh, others involved in the book trade, curators, collectors, um, uh, scholars, are uh, going to be responding to that or, or are already responding to that. Um, anybody want to jump in on that? Um, I'll take a swing at it. Um, uh, for our part, uh, we, we closed our open shop on March 14th and really focused a lot of energy into issuing more lists, which we only did periodically before, and, and to really connect with our established client base, both uh, private collectors and institutionally. Um, it's, uh, it's an inter interesting moment and it's, not, it's a challenge for a lot of us, but it's also not without its opportunity. I think a lot of people are using this time to reconnect with their collections or to take a breath. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, we're a resilient bunch. Uh, uh, as the previous clip showed, the, you know, the, the internet was a big sea change for our industry and, and for the entire rare book world. And, uh, you know, this is going to be a challenge, no doubt, but uh, it's a challenge we will overcome. And uh, I've been really inspired by seeing how many of my colleagues have responded. Some are doing, you know, curbside pickup. Um, my good friend Obadiah Baird at the Book Bin in Salem, Oregon is delivering books and coffee beans at the same time. God bless him. So, um, you know, we're, we're going to make it through. It's going to be a challenging couple of months. Um, but, um, you know, I'm, 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 I'm bullish on the future. Anyone else? Anyone else want to want to mention anything about this? Well, actually, I would just love to ask Athena, since here we are as the as the librarian on the panel, because uh, you know I certainly have been talking to librarians over the past two months, um, often to uh, you know to hold books for them because they can't receive them yet, uh, or understanding that uh, you know things we talked about might be on hold for a while because the budget might just not be there. You know that kind of you know, everyone is, is sort of dealing in real time with very, you know, changing policies, changing budgets. Um, I'm just wondering how you feel about the, you know, your, your response, because I think you are still buying, um, you know, in, in, in to some degree, even though you're not at the office right now. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts on the way this is impacting the special collections librarians community? Oh, wow. Uh I should, I should caveat this with my context is mine and I'm looking at all the names and they all have varying degrees of context. I come from a large uh, public institution with um, substantial endowment funds dedicated to collections. Uh, many of us have funds that are allocated by our university librarians and our deans. So um, some of those funds have to be reviewed in a different context to support the core mission of our universities, which is to support curriculum, learning, and teaching. And, but in my context, uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, I have a very dedicated uh, team of colleagues in the curators uh, group who are um, masterfully uh, led by my colleague, Heather Briston. And um, they are still uh, acquiring materials through these funds that are dedicated for acquisitions. Uh, we've worked with our booksellers to physically retain them uh, because we can't receive anything as, as you mentioned. And uh, I like what Brad said about taking a breath. One of the things that, uh, because I'm six months into my job at UCLA, um, which uh, my role was uh, vacant for five years, so um, we are, have been taking a big breath prior to this moment, but we're still breathing. And, um, and we are looking at our collection development priorities and goals 
through the lens of um, really structural and systemic change across the canon and um, where we can find synergies with our uh, book selling community, our donors, and the different areas that we work with uh, communities in a post custodial context to see where those gaps are, where meaningful gaps are in our collections. So it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a hybrid of both of those. Um, but I do know and I'm aware of colleagues who have um, completely frozen their acquisitions as of today. And I think all of us, including myself, are very concerned about the next uh, one to three fiscal years and what our budgets will look like. Um, and, and in my case, um, and my colleagues, I hope will, will agree, that we're, we're very um, dedicated to, to some of the collecting that, um, that will expand and frankly bust the canon. And we really wanna make sure that those uh, booksellers stay thriving <laughs> over this time and uh, really support um, some of those uh, global booksellers and smaller, smaller presses, places that we can, we can continue to uh, develop our collections. Okay, thanks everybody. So let's move on to the next clip and here's hoping I can get this fixed. Um, so let me, let me try sharing the screen again. Um, and How do we do there? Still hard to, for people to hear, apparently. About 30% better. If you've seen the film as many times as I have, you know what everyone's saying, but it's, it's, it's very faint. Gosh, I'm so sorry for this, folks. I don't know why it's not working how it was when we tested it. Um, Uh, it's been suggested that you might want to raise your volume on your yeah. video window. Yeah, I mean, Thank I, you, I, Glenn. I, I believe I've got it up as high as I can go okay. now. Um, so we may, we may have to do without the clips here, folks. I apologize. Um, uh, but uh, Kevin Young, um, uh, is talking about uh, curation and uh, the role of the curator in this whole book selling ecosystem. Um, and uh, um, uh, the importance of curators in, um, in the book selling, to the book selling profession and for book selling. Um, so uh, I wonder if the panelists could speak about um, that relationship uh, it's probably best to start with Athena here, uh, the relationship between curators and booksellers, uh, how that's changing, um, how institutional buyers are changing. Um, and uh, particularly for Athena, I think we could start with the question about are booksellers handling the kinds of materials institutions need and how, how that should be changing or how you see it changing. Then we can turn to the booksellers for their perspective on this. So Athena? Sure, sure. Um, I should uh, say that, um that my caveat again is the context from which I find myself and the team I work with at UCLA. Um, and I think we could spend a lot of time on the very obvious shift, which is the technology shift that we've all spoken to at the beginning of this chat. So that's sort of the, the overlaying um, sense that has shifted a lot of our work. Uh, was reacting to Tim Johnson's statement about, um, alluding to uh, Terry Bellinger's remark about online curation is shopping or something like that. And, and I will give you a sense of how we're coping with that, even when we've worked with online, uh, primarily online with booksellers, particularly at this time. 
Um, so we have a continued growth in collaboration among our curatorial team, our public services and instruction team, and our collections management team. So all of our purchases now are more justified and reasoned with respect to uh, not only cost of acquiring an item or items, but also the hidden costs of preserving and making them described better and having uh, anticipating the use of them. It's a broader dialogue that we have at UCLA and that um, our, within our spaces that includes uh, understanding what our faculty and undergraduates need, as well as which collections that we want to enhance uniquely and which connection, collections that we want to have uh, broad, ex, um, broaden our existing significant holdings. Um, something I want to just say really quickly about what hasn't changed between booksellers and, and curators is that, um, that, we, that they are still seen as experts uh, in the areas of their collecting by many of us. Um, I see them as trustworthy appraisers, those whom I've had the honor to work with in the past. Some of them are donors that I've seen on this call. Hello and um, members of our professional landscape. And they ensure that, um, and I can tell from some of the things I think Brad might mention, their commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion in their field as well. And I can't, I'd be remiss in not uh, mentioning as I know Heather has, and, and the women who paved the way for many of the women in this, in this field, like Barbara Rutenberg and many others that, that have helped uh, shape sort of the, the dynamics of, of the composition of booksellers. Um, I will say with, within our special collections, I have a phrase called autonomy with accountability. And by that I mean is what, how that relates to booksellers is that we have internal and documented processes and dialogues that happen with every purchase and every acquisition, regardless if it's a donation or purchase. And this is reflected in transparent and canon busting collecting goals and meaningful allocations of our budgets. I think the film, to go to your second question, touches on um, the roles that booksellers have um, in engaging collectors and identifying what's um, important in the physical and often the digital format that can represent the cultural and historical record. And there's a noted segue in the film, if you, have, if you don't, if you've seen it like Dan and I six or seven times now, there's a noted segue in the film from um, the understanding that books were sort of the drivers to this more archival and often non-monographical uh, nature of the collections that are uh, growing in interest in our field. And um, I would be remiss in not tell you all that I'm eagerly anticipating um, the release of Amy Hildreth Chen's book called Placing Papers, which is coming out in June. And this book will skillfully tackle the larger implications of the growing demand of contemporary manuscript and archival collections and how that demand uh, and attending growing costs affect our competitive natures as purchasing institutions. And as, as, as many of the, our booksellers know how they have to play a role in pricing that and understanding the market and the demands of the market. So no doubt, as you mentioned early on in this talk, that the impact of global, global economic pressures like the one we're in now make that question of what we need um, very important uh, for places, uh, for, uh, for each place, each institution to discuss and articulate so that your budget is aligning with the mission of your institution, your library, and your department. Um, and I think in those ways, uh, that is probably why even if we're doing this online or in ways where the, in the history I've had a bookseller visit with their, you know, luggage full of books and sharing some things, or I get the short list on, on a Tuesday catalog, either way, there's very deep work happening across our field and selection and, and contemplative understanding about use and purpose. These are enduring materials that we promise to hold forever. So we take that very, very, very strongly at, uh, and seriously at UCLA. And then I, I wanna just plug a little bit that there are other ways we collect materials through donations and through post-custodial contexts that might have that interplay with some of the stuff that Amy's talking about, about the valuation of the historical record. I don't wanna charge the entire rare book trade for changing our capitalist society, but there is certain elements of that, that that we need to think about as a field when we work with researchers who are exploring things like, like um, neoliberalism and what that means in the context of collecting. What is the, as one of my colleagues mentioned, what is the collector's gaze on their materials and how that impacts how people research with collections. So there's a lot going on. And uh, I, I hope I covered a little bit of what you asked and kind of giving you a sense of how we're thinking about collection building either through purchases or donations. Wow. Thanks, Athena. <laughs> it's always great to hear you speak. Oh, I uh, made talking points. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, no, fabulous. 
um, I think. So um, maybe we could go to Brad to, to hear a little bit more as the president of the ABAA, what you think about um, uh, bookselling uh, today and the relation, how the relationships have been changing or will be changing. Oh, well, that's a tough act to follow. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, well, speaking personally, uh, you know, I view the, our, our approach, uh, Jen and I, uh, is we, we like to establish relationships with the archivists and special collections librarians with whom we work. We have an ongoing dialogue uh, so we can understand, um, you know, their uh, constraints, um, what they're collecting, their needs, and we could be their eyes and ears. But at the same time, we're constantly, you know, handling materials, bringing in new acquisitions, and we sort of become um, their advocates and, you know, uh, temporary custodians until they can move on to special collections. And sometimes, yes, it is, and oftentimes it is, you know, a capitalist function, but many times, you know, there's material that uh, needs to be preserved and there's just there it, it doesn't make sense for us to invest our time in taking it to market and so we are consistently steering donations and I think most booksellers are as well because on both sides of the fence we recognize that this material is important and it deserves to be preserved. Um, Heather do you want to jump in here and add to that? You know I mean I think that that what Brad says is right on. Um, I mean, most booksellers are, you know, facing a constant continual stream of material that's coming across the desk. Now that stream is only, you know, for eight weeks has been purely digital and it's driving me insane, but still, you know, you're, you're constantly being offered things, looking at things, seeing things, and only some small percentage of that can you actually hope to purchase and then sell at a profit. But you come across so much other stuff. And what I am, I mean, what I feel like I would most like to see is stronger bonds between booksellers and librarians, not just personal friendships or, you know, particular isolated working relationships, but a stronger sense of sort of shared purpose, which is that all this material needs to be taken care of for future generations. And some people are in better positions to do it than others and educate yourself about who the people are when you're looking at, you know, when you're at, on a house call looking at a library that doesn't really have much resale value, but has, a, you know, a particular kind of research value that might be really right for an institution that is never going to get the call from these people because they don't know about this institution. Like, booksellers have a real role to play in terms of moving the material around, even if they're not actually taking a cut of it, um, which, you know, I think for most of us is only a small part of what we actually wind up looking at on any, any given day. Yeah. Thanks. Um, Dan, anything you want to add to that or should we move on? Well, we, um, either way we can move on. Uh, years ago, I'll just add that um, when I started uh, thinking about how I could connect better with librarians, I noticed there was, there were all these manuscripts out there that didn't weren't necessarily produced by famous people whether they be journals scrapbooks uh books and manuscript by people that um you know weren't published but there were all these ways in which depending on the the subject of that particular item you could find a collection where something like that would fit well so now when you go to a book fair versus say 25 years ago you see much more of this unique material and I think for librarians looking, by definition, a manuscript, um, you know, th these are unique items that don't, don't fit perhaps into something the library already has. Uh, it could be, they might have something similar, but it's a way of strengthening uh, the collection. So that was one way early on that I, I started to connect with more librarians, find out specifically, maybe it was women travelers in America, wh whatever the, the area was, um, there was a way to, to strengthen these collections through original manuscript material. Thanks. Okay, uh, time for another nerve wracking attempt at screen sharing. I'm gonna hope that uh, switching off my headset has solved the problem. Um, so fingers crossed here. Uh, let's see how it goes. Hopefully this is Arthur Fournier, uh, book, book and mostly archival uh, seller. Uh, talking about uh, materials of interest to younger generations of collectors. 
And I don't think book collectors buy objects. I think they buy stories. What are people of my generation and the coming generations interested in? They're interested in political economy. They're interested in questions about capitalism and socialism. They're interested in gender. They're interested in experimental music and the avant-garde and the long chain of history that connects Dada and surrealism to punk and hip hop. They're interested in drug culture, in sexuality. They're interested in exploration of identity. Did it work? Looks like it worked. Oh, sorry, folks. I'll go back and play the other two clips at the end. Um, so, okay. Um, that was Arthur talking about what he thinks are, are materials of interest to younger collectors. So, question for any of the panelists. Maybe let's start with the booksellers this time. Agree? Disagree? Is that what you're finding or not? Um, uh, and there's, there's also the question about private collectors and whether or not they are in fact becoming um, older or, or more rare. Are, are newer, younger collectors taking up more of a, more of a percentage of sales? Um, what do you all think? Um, maybe let's start with, with Heather this time um, to, to see what she thinks and then we'll, we'll move on to Brad and Dan and Athena. Well, you know, I think Arthur's List is one that we all immediately respond to and recognize because that is very much um, you're seeing more at book fairs now than you used to in the past and what institutions are actively pursuing because it's not what they've bought in the past. Um, whether or not that is like, I mean, I almost feel like watching that set piece in the documentary, I felt like that's a fantastic clip that's gonna be played a million times. And then it's gonna become like the thing people used to collect. Remember back in the days, the booksellers documentary, whenever, because something else will have like emerged as the, as the thing that everyone wants to, wants to do. And that's how it should be. I mean, it should be a continual process of people forging new things. Um, in terms of private collectors, it is very much the case. I mean, my experience just having like hung out with much older New York dealers for a long time now, you know, is that there's this constant sort of golden age nostalgia for the days, the days when, you know, Huntington and Folger and Morgan walked the earth and just bought whatever they wanted and built these enormous, you know, collections. Um, I mean, clearly some very, very large and expensive collections are still being built. You've got Jay Walker in the film and that's, you know, he's someone who routinely comes to the New York Book Fair and, you know, drops half a million dollars or whatever. And, and every, you know, everyone knows him because he's doing this thing that, you know, he's known as someone who really wants to acquire in an aggressive way and has the means to do it um, in a way that, that you know, only the, the richest institutions can do. And even they probably can't pursue it in that kind of single-minded way that an individual can. I, I mean, I think that the way people's lives have changed just makes that kind of model of collecting maybe less attractive to people in their 30s and 40s, even if they have means, it's just they, they don't envision themselves building like a dedicated library and filling it with stuff. Um, people seem to be so much more focused on mobility now and being able to, you know, move different places and a kind of like gig lifestyle where, you know, everything's kind of on your phone. Um, which isn't to say that, you know, there aren't younger collectors, but I don't know. I, fi I find the, the conversation about wealthy collectors and whether or not we're all now like impoverished because there are not private collectors like that, almost impossible to engage with fruitfully because whatever you say, it just sounds like sort of sour grapes, like you're waiting for some rich person to come and like make your, you know, make your year. I guess I prefer not to think of my work in that way. And certainly that's not the kind of collector I'm typically dealing with when I'm dealing with private collectors. So um, it's hard for me to, to mourn the passing of something I never really personally experienced. Thanks, Heather. Brad or Dan, um, wanna jump in? Sure. Um, I mean, I, I entered the book trade probably a few years after Dan and cut my teeth at the old Burbank book fairs back in the early 90s. And I, I tell you, book selling is like punk. People have been saying it's dead for years. <laughs> um, and uh, I see no evidence of that. Um, uh, I, I've got a somewhat unique vantage point in that um, 
I serve a lot of masters or we serve a lot of masters here. We have an open shop on a main street here in Southern California. We do online sales, auctions, appraisals, you name it, uh, anything to make ends meet. But um, you know, from the point of view of the open shop, I see young people in here on a daily basis collecting. And they are, many of them are still forming that sort of traditional library of you know, stately looking books on the shelves. But um, I think um, as Arthur uh, Clip alludes, yeah, there is a general tendency towards this um, sort of avant-garde um, DIY, you know, material that um, is, has frankly been under collected and uh, is finally getting the appreciation it deserves. Dan, anything to add? Um, yeah, I'll just say, in connection with what's already been said, um, here in New York, for the longest time, if, if you walked into an, uh, an apartment and they were people of, of means, a phrase that was used already, you would see almost certainly what was referred to as the gentleman's library. And that was true for, you know, really decade after, after decade. That's no longer true. Um, and as someone who's a generalist, there's there there are collectors of all kinds that have emerged, particularly for visual material, ephemeral uh, things, and uh, the look of the New York Book Fair has changed over the years from rows of books, brown books, to now you'll have broadsides. Just e even the early printed books are opened up, so you can actually see them. So a movement toward a, the increasingly visual sense uh, has has been taking place for quite some time, and I, I see that continuing in the future. Athena? Sure, I'll, I'll just speak very, uh, from the other perspective of like, the, the original question was, is that what the young people are doing or the newer, and you know, the schism of, of age notwithstanding, because I, I have, uh, that transcends all age groups in terms of modern or contemporary collecting. But one thing uh, that it excites me about our field is that uh, we're getting more and more interconnected as a field. So we know what each other has and where we can guide our users to. So if we don't have a, a certain collection uh, related to something that someone at Smith has, we can tell them about it and, and encourage them on their journeys if they're there or, co or contact them online to use it. Whereas if, you know, if somebody wants to see a really awesome uh, punk collective, uh, hopefully they're sending them to UCLA to talk to us about, about our collection. So, um, but that, that idea of collecting and collector, I just, I want to kind of tease into this dialogue, even if it's just a talking point for the audience, is, um, has a lot to do with uh, born digital collections, uh, not even digitized collections, but there's born digital collections. People are collecting emails, they're collecting tweets, they're collecting images on their phone. Um, there, as, as I believe Dan or Brad said, this whole DIY movement is, is alive and kicking in a digital landscape. So there's, uh, I know that Arthur has, has uh, walked into those spheres and his, his, uh, his selling of, of materials. And I think it's very important for us to recognize that, that the, the born digital landscape is, um, is something that, that is still ripe for us to think about. And then finally, Heather, um, not being able to lament uh, large uh, wealthy collectors, I, I don't have any capacity to l lament the wealthy white man's library. That is not the reason why I'm in this field. And frankly, it's hopefully not the reason that you invited me on this panel because then you're sorely mistaken. But, um, but I will say that uh, I cut my teeth in, a, in an appreciation and a love for Shakespeare and Chaucer. My only difference is I don't think they're gods. And there's a lot more going on in in our, in our research uh, enterprise and what we're trying to do. So there's still a lot of uh, critical thinking we can do with medieval manuscripts through a modern lens, as much as we can take uh, an illuminated manuscripts and, and juxtapose it to a fantastic zine and teach an amazing class. And actually, I just wanted to jump on something that Athena just said when just talking about the sort of born digital um, habits of mind and a kind of natural collecting that comes with um, the way that people interact with images that are being streamed past them, thousands of them every single day. What I think is most actually exciting about this generation of collectors is that they have a real facility with that, but that often there's, there's no necessary um, opposition between having a real response to something like a, a Tumblr or a, a Pinterest page or, you know, that to collecting these images and seeing connections between them and then appreciating the objects 
on which in many cases they were originally based and coming to love the collection of that as well. I think that the interplay between physical material collections and a kind of disembodied, um, you know, image-based just language of reference that we are all engaged in so much of every day is one that has like enormous power to improve people's eye and, and to expand their interest in terms of materials that would be worth preserving patterns that could be seen that no one had noticed before because they just didn't have the opportunity to see that much. I feel like we're actually living in a really exciting moment for the development of a curatorial eye in which almost everyone has an opportunity to do it in a way that wasn't always the case. Um, and so I'm excited by that as a bookseller. Okay, um, thanks for adding that. I'm gonna get the last clip queued up here and then we'll go back and play the other two while people are starting to file in with questions. Um, this is a perfect opportunity to uh, plug the Honey and Wax book selling, book uh, collecting prize as well, which I think is open for one more month. Heather can correct me if I'm wrong about that. Um, for a young collector of 30 or, 30 or younger, is that right, Heather? Yes. Uh, the prize, uh, the deadline's June 1st, so there's still like three weeks to go. Um, and I have to say that this year I'm really, uh, I'm eager to see the applications that we get. And I know we'll get some good ones, but our partners in the prize in the past, the people who've been most helpful to us, have been bookstores and libraries. And bookstores and libraries have been closed during the pretty much the entire application period. So they haven't been giving out flyers at checkout. They haven't been able to pass stuff out to patrons. So um, I'm hoping actually that the movie maybe does a little bit of that work in terms of reminding people about this and of course like social media and uh, and that kind of thing because um, it's been very odd to be running the prize in in a place where people aren't meeting to talk about books in, in real life for the first time in a while. Okay, and leads perfectly into the last clip. Um about women hidden in bookselling history and women prominent in bookselling history. Here it is. One thing that has been frustrating to me is when I started in the rare book trade full time in 2004, the ABA was about 85% male. But I was told that like at any minute, this was gonna change. There were waves of women coming. That just give it a second, the demographic's gonna tip, it's gonna be all different. And you know, now it's, 15 years later, and it's 85, 15 still. Yes, there are famous women book dealers who own their own business, like Rostenberg and Stern, but looking at them as these sort of exceptions and a small percentage of business owners that are women is undercutting what's really the case in the culture of rare books, which is that women have been here and contributing the entire time. They have been cataloging, they've been doing a lot of the work behind the scenes. Okay. Stop there. Um, so this one's uh, mostly for the booksellers. Um, so maybe we can start with uh, um, Brad, move on to Heather and Dan from there. Um, do you see bookselling become a, a more diverse, equitable, welcoming profession? Um, I hope you do. And if you do, how? How does that happen or how do we get there? Sure. Um, uh, well, as many of you know, I'm relatively new to my position as president of the ABA. And um, shortly after taking office, I, I laid out an agenda for my term before our board. And uh, one of the first things on the list uh, uh, was a diversity initiative. And we have since taken the initial steps to establish this program. Um, as many of you know, the ABA has established a women's initiative. Uh, it's been running for the past couple of years, led by Claudia Scholson and Heather and Susan Benny, Kate Manning, among others. And while there's uh, still oh, much work to be done, uh, their efforts have successfully moved the needle. Um, I, I can, I recall when I first got onto the board, uh, the ABA's board, uh, there was a moment there was only one woman and now we're approaching gender parity, which is where it needs to be. Um, the challenge for the ABA is a little bit unique in that we're a collective of 450 small businesses, most of them uh, single owner operators. But I really think it's essential that we foster inclusivity by creating apprenticeship and mentorship opportunities and reaching out to communities that are really underrepresented in the book trade. Um, and I think we could do that while working together 
with our friends in the special collections and archival world. Uh, I really, really respect uh, the work that RBMS does in confronting often difficult issues. Um, and there are many things like the language we use and how we deal with culturally sensitive materials that the rare book trade really needs to, to discuss and confront. And I want the EBA to be an active leader in these conversations. And I hope that we can work with ACRL, RBMS on, you know, programming and initiatives to foster this inclusivity. Um, I think it'll pay dividends. I think it's essential for our future. And I think there's a lot we can learn from one another. Heather, can you jump in? I mean, I would just, you know, say that for us, when we were starting the women's initiative, um, you know, we really looked to RBMS, um, ACRL, the, the work that librarians have been doing over the past decade, you know, having these conversations and trying so hard and also meeting frequently with a lot of frustration and disappointment that, you know, the best intentioned initiatives somehow failed to achieve the desired effect. When I say in the movie that this is a question that we actively struggle with, I don't mean it's like a question that we are triumphantly succeeding over. I mean, we are actively struggling with it. We are working hard um, and trying to learn from anyone who has lessons to teach us about how to do outreach better. Um, you know, we have made definite progress and I definitely felt, especially in the past couple of years at book fairs, that the vibe of the crowd is just so different than it was when I started in the trade um, in a way that is really heartening to me. I just feel like there's a much more robust representative sample of people and interests in the room. And that's what I want to see. I mean, that ultimately, like, what do I want for the next decades of my career? I want to be part of a much more inclusive and representative, and in that sense, accurate and interesting historical, you know, work of preservation than, than has, you know, than the trade has, has done in the past, than libraries have done in the past. I feel like we all have a lot of room to improve. Um, and for me, the challenge is just constantly like, what is the effective, what are the most effective ways to do it? And sometimes you take one step forward and feel like you've, you know, you've secured something fantastic, but then realize that, you know, it's not, it's not just a question of getting, putting together a scholarship or a, a mentorship program or, you know, putting some money somewhere and hoping that that transforms the demographics of a really historic, entrenched um, and complicated field. Um, I feel like this this is going to be um, a question and a process that is going to engage me for the rest of my entire professional life. And literally, all I want to do is librarians out there who are hearing your bookseller colleagues talk about their hopes for the future. Any wisdom you have, I think I can say that like many of us would love to talk with you about ways to strengthen, I mean, not just, you know, sort of diversity within our two siloed little areas, but a larger community of, of people who are genuinely talking to one another and learning from one another and not just trying to kind of fix something um, in, in a way that probably, you know, is not possible and only will lead to a sense that like, well, it's, it's you know, that was, that was pointless. We shouldn't even have tried that. So yeah, that's me. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll just um, add a couple of things to that. So I, when we first were carving out a structure for the film, uh, when thinking of, of different things that we wanted to, to make sure we covered, um, I'm so glad that, that the role of women, not only in the trade, but as collectors, that we decided to feature that as prominently um, as we did. We can feel in any of these discussions how passionate people are about it. And just uh, to connect um, to what Rebecca said about that women were always in the trade, although um, my first job in the business was Second Story Books. Uh, it was a firm owned by Alan Stipek, but the person who hired me uh, was Judy Knight, a uh, woman who managed the Bethesda location. Uh, and Judy was my first mentor in, in, in the business, and I, I still think about her all the time. She had this incredible ability to be able to um, assess what was special about a book. And, and just in terms of going and looking at libraries with her and sorting books, when I think back to those those my early you know, months and years doing that, 
um, I just owe so much, so much to Judy. So she's an example of someone who, who was there um, and was a, a part of this. Okay, let's pause there. I want to make sure to play the other, the previous two clips because that this is recorded and that will become part of the context here. So let me play those while people are getting their questions in. I see the questions are starting to come in already and we'll have about 10 minutes for those. Um, so let me um, play these two clips and then we'll come back for uh, answers by the panelists to these questions. The internet always for the antiquarian book business is going to be a double-edged sword. In the modern marketplace, you either have to have the best, the cheapest, or the only copy. What the internet did was to really change the way we talked about what was rare. For people at the top of the trade or dealing in really specialized material, the internet was a huge godsend because in a way it just validated their position. I have material you can't get. But for a lot of people who dealt in fairly common modern firsts, for example, it was devastating, you know, and it destroyed their livelihood and they've Okay. Hey, Baldwin, as a, a learning to be writer, including early poems and things like that, to him becoming the writer that we know and love. A curator is yet another role in the library, and the curator, which is what I was for years, thinks about the ways that material can not only come into the institution, but I think go out into the world. But I think also thinking about the collection in a holistic way, thinking about the future of the collection and what it means, how to show the connections within material. I do think it has to come in some sense with a love of the material. Okay. Yay. We've played them all and we could actually hear them. Um, all right. So let's get into the questions now um, uh, from folks. We've got, we've got a few minutes yet. Uh, there was a question about um, how you balance the challenge of conferring value on archival materials from underrepresented, um, underrepresented populations. Um, and allowing local or community organizations to gain or maintain control of the cultural and historical production of their own communities. I think this is a great question for anybody to answer. So um, anybody want to start with that? Athena maybe might be a good place to start with that, uh, with that answer. Sure. Um, but I can only speak to research value and the value of these collections to our work. Uh, I certainly don't want to unethically put a, a monetary value, but I will again allude to this now I know there's a, an actual panel coming up to Amy Hildreth Chen's book that is in the chat uh, box so hopefully you all cut and paste that in and attend that panel I know I will uh, time permitting um, but I will say that uh, something that I, I've been wanting to articulate throughout this uh, whole um, webinar or whatever we're calling this panel uh, RBMS fun uh, is that the the agency and the direct voices of the creators of um, communities that were typically marginalized, sometimes inten intentionally erased, and often forgotten or even not considered as part of the historical record, has tremendous research value to us. Actually, I don't think the 19th century is going to be forgotten. I, I think for the rest of our life, we'll know who Shakespeare is. I'm really worried about the 1970s indigenous women's experience in parts of this country. I'm extremely concerned about those people coming into the Black Lives Matter movement and into our communities and into our workspaces and building their own community archives. I, and by I say worry, I mean that from a personal level, but from a professional level, how do we as uh, institutional archives that are already nested in a colonial context, whether we want to be or not, it's, it is the academy, um, how do we connect to these communities of practice and empower them through post-custodial relationships um, when they're ready or considering um, uh, thinking about donating and wanting to know their options and they bring up the potential for selling? Of course, I would give them a list of, of uh, ABA certified booksellers who deal in, in certain parts of their, their, their um, topics, but I also frankly caution them and I say, I don't know how much expertise is in that community, but I do know that there's a thirst to learn and there's a willingness to understand how you value your words. And I hope by Brad and Heather and Dan's comments that that's very true across the whole community of booksellers. 
Um, but that, that's what excites me about, um, about this kind of value and what we're thinking about and why it's really imperative that um, we don't let something like 1923, that's why we can put everything online, be the driver if we move into remote learning for an indefinite future, that we really think about these complicated rights issues and issues of ownership for voices that need to be part of the historical record. Any of the booksellers want to wade into the very tricky issue of monetary value playing into this? I could dance around it a little bit. <laughs> um, uh, I will say that um, I, I, our, I feel like our role as booksellers a lot of time is uh, the sort of boots on the ground. Um, we're out there trying to make sure this stuff doesn't get lost, um, you know, and uh, in terms of collections to make sure to keep that collection together, you know, the, so it, it continues to maintain its scope and it doesn't, you know, just blow off to the wind. Um, you know, uh, we have um, a network of scouts. Uh, we have we are up at dawn, going to every single flea market, um, and uh, we're doing our best to source and preserve this material and pass it on to the institution where um, it's going to be utilized the most. That's something that's very important to Jennifer and I. We when we we get an item. Uh, we are we are really really diligent in trying to find the institution where it's going to be used. Um, there are a lot of institutions with very large budgets, and um, even though they will do everything in their power to preserve it, and um, and that's important unto itself, it really needs to be before students and scholars. You know, it needs to be part, uh, as Athena said, of the narrative of the historical record. I don't know if Heather wants to join in. Um, well, I would just say picking up on um, what you both said, um, you know, there, we are, in, the, in the film, there is a, a bit of a discussion actually coming from two very different places, from Glenn Horowitz on the one side and then from Arthur on the other about the, the archive as sort of a model for, um, for generating, uh, you know, for running a business, for dealing in archives. Um, I, because I never deal in archives, this is one of those things that sometimes sort of like born digital materials where I often feel like fantastic. I don't have to pay attention because this is actually not what I do. However, um, I am paying attention. And um, you know, what I would say is when Athena was saying, you know, I will send you to people, but I'm not sure how much they know about the material. I, I think it's quite clear at this point, um, And I would hope would, would be, you know, maybe we should just explicitly state it that the um, even just limiting yourself to the booksellers of the ABA, which is like 450, a tiny percentage of the number of booksellers in the United States, you're dealing with like an incredible range, not just a range of expertise, but but also a range of sort of scholarly interest and awareness. And there are almost certainly people who can do a fantastic job on almost anything, but you might not know exactly who that person is because there might only be two or three in the country who are really capable of handling like a particular kind of archive in a really sensitive and historically informed way. And I don't just mean historically informed about what prices they brought. I mean, historically informed about how this material was produced and how it might be used, you know, productively going forward. Um, and that's another reason why I just feel like booksellers and librarians need to talk to each other a lot more because it's very possible that, you know, a bookseller like me, if I received that call would be like, you do not want me doing that because that is really not what I do. However, let me tell you about, you know, these three people who have done very similar things, you know, to, to the great profit of everyone involved. Um, I think, you know, it's, there's so much knowledge out there and you just have to figure out who has it. This is like, the challenge for all of us in our work. Indeed. Um, we are at two o'clock. Gina, can we take one more question or do you, do you think we need to wrap it up? Uh, no, you can go for about five more minutes. Okay, so let's take, well, there's one more question in the chat um, uh, about uh, the impression of sexism um, in the trade. So what sorts of efforts uh, can be made to counter uh, the impression of sexism in the in the trade to the general public. Um, uh, any of the booksellers want to weigh in on that? Um, could you the the question? Who's I mean, whose impression? The experience of people in the trade, or the experience of people from 
of, of buyers when they come to a fair? Or I'm not sure I understand the... My, my sense is the impression of people um, who are buyers or otherwise um, involved in the trade in non-book selling ways. Right, how to counter the impression. Well, the best way to counter the impression would ha be to have the impression be just increasingly less accurate. <laughs> And then, you know, then it would simply, you know, the, the more, and, and I feel like even in my lifetime, I have seen progress on that. You know, the more women are owning businesses, the more women are out there being experts in their field, being the face of, of the trade, then the less it will seem like an exclusively male world. That's not an exclusively male world, but um, similarly, it, you know, the trade would look a lot less white if it were a lot less white. And so I think we should really be trying, we should be focusing less on the impression that we're making and on actually creating a reality that, that is, uh, that, that does reflect more accurately the, the realm of buyers, sellers, producers, everyone having to do with, with books. Um, I would just urge people also to talk to booksellers and like just really just talk to them and not be intimidated because that has been the thing that I think has been most striking to me is, is how many people have stayed in the trade because of a conversation that they once had at a book fair with some random person. Like we, you know, you don't realize how much power your words have. Um, and, and so it, I, I would say, uh, talking to people is, is, and, and engaging them on their experience is a way of kind of breaking down a lot of the inhibitions a lot of people have about feeling uncomfortable or awkward or out of place or maybe like they're not welcome. Um, because in truth, people genuinely are welcomed by almost everyone. Um, it's just, it can, be, it can be hard to get past the sort of, you know, uh, the wall, I guess, and of any closed. Can I just add something, Will? Uh, I'm yep. sorry, Heather, I didn't let you finish. Um, I just want to say, from my perspective, uh, it's more than just, at this point, I'm beyond correcting because I'm not anybody's mama except Jake Jackson, but I am going to expect a, a, a code of conduct that is respected, that people can understand and realize and have meaningful um, correction happen in a way that's systemic and structural. Um, I have said over my career that I am no longer taking the water cooler down the hallway allyship like, oh, you said that thing so well, or I really supported what you said. I don't buy it anymore unless you said it at the table, unless you said it at the microphone. Please don't give me any more water cooler allyship. I have enough of that in my own head. I need systemic and structural change. I, we, us, I shouldn't just say I, but I, I myself, I remember, and I've said this to some booksellers and I won't call them out, even though they're wonderful, lovely people. There were quite a few people at my first RVMS where I did not have any institutional affiliation. In fact, my parents paid for me to go. And, um, and most of the booksellers, I'm a very forward person, Heather. I will talk to anybody. I'm sure everybody will know that. And did not even acknowledge me. I didn't have purchasing power. There were three. And those three booksellers, you know, it's like, pretty woman, like big mistake, right? Everybody like, hey, you know, and, and, and I'm sorry to do it that way, but it was, it was really surprising to me that, um, that so many people were just uh, looking at your badge rather than wanting to know you. So I think there's some, some code of conduct that has to happen in, in across the, the entire communities of practice. Frankly, I know RBMS has a lot to do, SAA has a lot to do, the Academy has a lot to do, but when we are talking about things as as just fundamental as sexism, racism, any kind of um, uh, uh, misgendering, all of those things must just be explicitly labeled in the codes of conduct when you attend these events. Sorry to get on a soapbox, but that's really, no, no, no. really important. Oh, no, well, actually, yeah, yeah. So interesting. Well, Brad will talk about it, but the, yeah, no, go. Uh, no. Uh, so, sorry, no, I mean, uh, as Heather was about to say, uh, the ABA has it's a very robust code of conduct and it's something we, it's a living document. It's something we take very, very seriously. We have an ethics committee. Uh, any complaint that's made to us, we fully investigate. Um, we are 100% committed to an atmosphere of mutual respect and inclusivity and any deviation from that is unacceptable. 
I mean, and, and that is true. And that is something that has been much, much stronger in recent years. What Athena is talking about, people not talking to people they don't think can spend money, um, although that's not identical, is harder to police um, than, than, you know, um, and th with that, I just don't know what to say, except that I am seeing the results, you know, I'm seeing karma play out in real time in my life. And I think it sounds like it's playing out now with Athena at UCLA <laughs> being in a position to decide who to buy from and deciding not to buy from, you know, people who were disrespectful and, um, you know, and frankly disinterested in the past. Um, although that's, that's probably not, I mean, that's yeah. not a hundred percent true, obviously, it's not but, 100%. But, but the impression but, but, they made on me professionally was pretty negative. Yeah. There's a, I mean, also part of the trouble for the trade as Brad alluded to earlier in this hour is just that there's not, there aren't the, the sort of larger structures that you have in place institutionally that enable you to, to, do much effective um, policing because it's everybody working in their own isolated little place and they're not really accountable to anyone unless they do something really bad. And so it's like, you know, there's there's a lot of sort of low level stuff that doesn't exactly rise to harassment, but that like it definitely impacts the tone of things. And yet it's hard to know like who, you know, how, how to manage it because it's not like you can have like whatever HR step in and talk to the, the cause there's no HR, there's no, you know, yeah. It's an ongoing challenge for sure. But, uh, but yes, a code, a code of conduct and a code of ethics and some general agreement on uh, the way we treat each other is, is crucial. And I'm glad to see that that's been a priority of the ABA in recent years. Um, I hope more so, yeah. I hope that you all know that I have a positive, optimistic view of our future. <laughs> and I, I think we can get through this together. I think that we need a healthy dose of humility and being comfortable with uh, discomfort, uncomfortable conversations like we're having now. Uh, and this movie, uh, Daniel, Dan, you, you filled a big important gap for us. And I myself can't wait to to, to share this to students as a primer to understanding that part of, of the field. So you all should be really proud of yourself for adding to the lexicon and the curriculum of book collecting and your role. So I just wanted to shout that out. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, any kind of respect begins on an individual level. So, I mean, I've had male booksellers tell me they, they would go into a, a, a bookseller's booth um, before they had been established themselves and they were just shocked at how they were treated. So. You know, all of this, it's individual has to rise up and uh, bear responsibility for, for how they treat other people. So I, that's, uh, you know, something to keep in mind at all times. Um, and for anyone who enjoyed the film, I'll just say as we're getting to, to wrap up here, the DVD release is, I believe, June 9th. Certainly that's, that's not off by more than a, a day or so. Um, should be on, on the website. Uh, but there's, there's some very lovely bonus features um, on the DVD and a uh, way of continuing the discussion. Great. So we are, we are well over time, so we probably should um, uh, end things here, but uh, we had a really nice uh, conversation, I think. Um, lots of really interesting things brought up. So thanks to all the panelists. Um, thanks to Dan in particular for facilitating the use of the clips, which we finally got to work. Apologies for that. Um, and uh, thank you all for attending. We had a nice, nice attendance. And um, like I said, this has been recorded, so this will be available along with the chat. Um, so you can get in there and, and uh, follow up more. Um, so thank you all. Um, we'll uh, see you around online. Um, stay safe, stay well. Thank you. Thanks, Will. Thanks. Take care, everyone. Bye.